This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. And Doc, as you know, one of our fine partners at the Detroit Sports Podcast Network is The Athletic. And The Athletic Detroit specifically is fine and premium coverage for passionate, hugely passionate Detroit sports fans. And listeners of this very episode of Tiger Stock of Chirco and Company can get 30% off, yes, 30% off, the first year of an annual subscription to The Athletic by visiting today, theathletic.com slash DSP. <laughs> And welcome, welcome, welcome to the latest, the freshest edition of Tiger Stock with Chirco and Company. I am your host, Vito Geronimo Chirco, along with my usual psychic and broadcast partner and fun. That is Doc from Doc and Jack, John Charles McElroon. John, how are you doing? Vito, congratulations, man. Um, the biggest game for the Detroit Tigers this season was the Alan Trammell retirement game. Many people obviously got there early, your family included, to get the uh, Alan Trammell 1984 replica jersey. Everybody was excited for that game. Everybody penciled it in. When we previewed the season, we talked about a couple games that your family was going to go to, and you guys purchased a package, which included the Jack Morris game, the Alan Trammell game, a couple other marquee matchups. And as media members, you obviously want to be there when the big timers are speaking, and everybody wanted a chance to be around when Alan Trammell was going to address the media, be part of that ceremony, because um, Alan Trammell, like many have said, uh, baseball writers, everybody that's known him, Alan Trammell is known as one of the heartbeats of the Detroit Tigers. Just based on the fact that he played from 77 to 96, he was a former manager, he's had uh, the opportunity to win a World Series in Detroit with the organization. He's been part of several great memories all across Major League Baseball, and everybody that was part of it really came away feeling, wow, what a way to honor Alan Trammell. And the best part about it was, even though it was funny in the way in which it went down, you were able to cover it on behalf of the Detroit Sports Podcast Network, and it really did kind of stamp our presence there at the Detroit Tigers in terms of our coverage. And I just wanted to say I was proud of you for what you did. You went down there early. You were able to kind of set the scene and let people who weren't there in. And that's really all we're trying to do is to say, hey, we're, we're like everybody else. We love Detroit sports. We're passionate about it. We love broadcasting. And we just want everybody to kind of, you know, that follows us. I want basically anybody that follows at Detroit Podcast, at Vito Jerome, to feel like, hey, we're just like one of the boys, and we were, we're there. Even though you might not have bought a ticket, maybe you couldn't wait since 9 a.m., I want everybody to get a sense of what it was like. And not only did you do that, which was awesome, getting the photos of the ceremony, getting the photos of the decor around the field and things like that, but also you being in the media scrums, asking Alan Trammell yes. an important question, which garnered an 80-second response, which was also played on the radio. What more can you ask for? And for me, being competitive, I know that we provided better coverage than others, and that's all I can ask for. And you did a good job. There you job. go. Premium, passionate coverage for passionate Detroit sports fans at the Detroit Sports Podcast Network that we provide on a weekly basis via this platform, Tigers Talk, all our weekly podcasts, too, at the DSP Network, Doc. Now, to share a laugh with everybody, you really didn't believe you were going to get approved. Why? No, well, last minute, because it happened last minute. I mean, that's the honest take or truth here. I mean, based on what happened with us in terms of when we got credentialed, we were notified on Sunday a.m. right before the ball game at 110. The ceremony started after 1215, so I didn't officially know until, well, you got word yourself. I never About received word. So luckily, we received word, and then I thought, well, yeah, it was past 7, past 8 a.m., almost past 9 a.m., right, when we got the word that we were credentialed to cover the game finally. So luckily, like right before 9, like at 845, we were verified as credentialed media members for Sunday's game. Which was funny because I told you we were going back and forth. I'm like... It might come last minute. Maybe they got to go through it, and maybe they have to actually get into the office and go through it. And I'm like, you know what? There's a chance that they're going to get into the office, see it, and just go, all right. And uh, that's what they did. It's kind of funny. And now, as well, in doing this, we learn lessons each and every opportunity we can to um, apply. And we kind of assume that, well, okay, when you do it on a game-by-game basis, a game of that stature with Alan Trammell, they're going to say, okay, it's filled. But, no, there were seats available. And, and there were, definitely in the press box. We were in the mix. We were in the mix, baby. Awesome. It was great to see. And uh, I think for us, 
Never assume. And I do think we can assume now that we will always get a reply if we apply to things. It's just uh, when, and uh, if it's a no, hopefully it can be in a timely manner. But I think the way we've been doing is great. We message, and uh, we get the notice, and you and I work together to get all the necessary passes. And then it started, like, okay, I want this, I want that, I want this, and it was great. It was just what I wanted. And like I said, the cherry on the topping of the experience was you asking a question. I never thought in terms of what could happen that you would actually be in a media scrum. I didn't think they would actually do that, but it was awesome, and it was a great opportunity for you to see um, Lou Whitaker share some jokes, and I think that moment was very humorous where he said, I might just go out there and scratch my name on there. Yeah, he did very say that, funny. Like spray paint his name out there. Everybody yes. was talking about Lou Whitaker and the fact that he was a little bit more jovial and uh, he was cordial, and he's starting to kind of feel it a little bit, knowing that if Alan Trammell, Jack Morris were – honored and they're looking at numbers based on this veterans committee it's probably safe to assume Lou Whitaker is going to be in right well the push for Whitaker has started I mean all his former teammates the guys that have recently been enshrined into Cooperstown have brought him up his name keeps being brought up constantly 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 so you would think yeah doc that he has momentum now behind him to get into the hall finally via the veterans committee and so what was it like being in the room with him he was pretty much a friendly guy there it seemed like which was really classy that both Jack Morris and Alan Trammell, in their experiences, they also took time to honor Lou Whitaker and said, look, we, he's a big part of this as well, and they definitely made notion, and they made a mention specifically to say, hey, it's his time, and hopefully we'll come back in two years for the same situation. And Whitaker himself said, well, I'll probably see you guys in two years, two years from now, when he could get enshrined in Cooperstown via the Veterans Committee. So it could happen still for Sweet Lou, who has a higher war, than career war, that is, and Alan Trammell, than guys that are in the Hall of Fame. And Alan Trammell had to wait all this time when he had a better war than a couple of guys as well that were enshrined into Cooperstown prior to him, including, uh, I know for sure, uh, Ernie Banks. I think Barry Larkin as well. I put it into my article, my recap of the game of the Trammell ceremony that we produced for the DSP Network blog. It's on our Tumblr blog. You can check it out there, my recap of Sunday's game, but Trammell, man, and you know, first with Whitaker, you had brought up he was jovial, he was kind of glowing and joking around, and he was. He was very open and pleasant with the media, and from what I heard from those that had covered him when he was playing and donning the old English D, Lou Whitaker was very much to himself, Doc. He wasn't open with the media. He was much more open with the media on Sunday and willing to joke with the media, exchanging pleasantries with the media. And then Tram, when he came and he spoke after Whitaker, Tram was a man of class and high character, always has been a dignified man, a man of class and character. And he expressed it fully to the media on Sunday and was very open, willing to answer all questions. And he spoke for a long time with the media, once again took a ton of questions and really expressed grace and dignity and thanked his teammates that he played with. He made a mention of his former teammates and made you know made it important to him a part of his speech mentioning his teammates and thanking them as well and he said that without Whitaker he wouldn't have been there on Sunday would not have been well enshrined in Cooperstown would not have had his number three uh, jersey number retired as well and put onto the brick wall in left center field at Comerica Park so was very gracious of the moment and thankful for his teammates contributions as well Doc. So overall, definitely a great job by the Detroit Tigers. The videos, uh, Dan Dickerson always is a quality MC. It was a great experience. They let us in, and definitely you did a great job. Overall, for you, what were you thinking? Were you like, wow, I can't believe from the time in 2015 when you started until now, here you are in the mix, basically covering the biggest story in Detroit sports that day, and you were part of it. You were right there among the TV people, the radio people, and now the podcast people. You're one of the boys, and you were there. What was it like? What were you thinking in that whole experience where you're like, damn, Doc is so annoying. I got to block his ass. Well, he is, but (laughs) I know that much. I was feeling like not one of the boys, one of the men, okay? Oh, okay. No longer a boy, a true man. I met Jeff Rieger. It was cool seeing him, talking to him for the first time. Jeff Rieger of 97 won the ticket. I know he knows Adam. Adam was an intern at 97 won the ticket. So he got to know Jeff Rieger and their boys, I guess. But we're men, Rieger and I. And all the other guys I got to see in the media scrum for that press conference with Whitaker, for the press conference afterwards with Trammell. It was great to be a part of Tiger's lore. Tiger's history. And Trammell is Mr. Tiger number two. It's Al Kaline number one. He is the true Mr. Tiger, right? He is proclaimed as such and deserves the title. But the second guy in command or the second guy that would deserve that title of Mr. Tiger is Alan Trammell. 
By far, he deserves that title. Outside of uh, Al Kaline. Kaline number one, but Trammell probably the greatest Tiger outside of Kaline. And the greatest Tiger shortstop of all time, Alan Trammell. So really, you could say, Doc, that was the biggest day of the Tiger season. Yeah. That was the biggest day of the Tiger season, and I was there able to cover the day. And to share an experience with me covering the Detroit Tigers when they played the White Sox last Friday, all of a sudden you're walking, and all of a sudden it kind of seemed like everybody stopped and paid attention to this um, older media member, and he walked in with this big, huge book with the number three on it. And I'm looking, and I'm like, wait a minute, that's Tom Gage, legendary Major League Baseball Hall of Famer. And I'm like, wait a minute, he's a Hall of Famer for, for being a writer. So he's laughing it up, talking to a bunch of different people, and I, I go to my normal seat, you know, off to the right, and all of a sudden he comes in and sits down. And, and in the press box, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I got my notepad out because obviously what happened was on Friday I forgot my laptop. So I always keep a, a notepad just in case someone calls me in the car for something important. So I had my notepad and a pen, and I look over, and there's Tom Gage just sitting there um, in the press box. So I just turn to him and say, hey, Mr. Gage, I'm John Macaroon. I started a podcast a couple years ago. I'd love to have a couple seconds. Would you like to uh, answer a couple questions about being here? He's like, sure. And he went off, and we asked questions. And he was like, yeah, sure, no problem. He was very cordial and was able to give me great quotes regarding his thoughts, and he, he echoed the same thing. And he said that the joy of covering Alan Trammell was it was like speaking to your next-door neighbor. Mm -hmm. And that was back in a different era where you probably could get even closer to some of these athletes. And Tom Gage you know, was a baseball writer for nearly four decades, and he was a prominent figure covering baseball and obviously earning his way to become a member of the Hall of Fame you know, as a baseball writer. And so he was so cordial. I asked him a couple questions about what it was like to cover Alan Trammell and what it meant to him to be part of that weekend. And that was also pretty awesome as part of our uh, coverage was to talk to somebody with a little bit of more insight than we have regarding covering baseball. But he was very cordial, very friendly, very funny. And it was very uh, awesome to start off the weekend talking to him about baseball. But overall, you felt like you were part of the mix and you deserved it. Um, your family also got a chance to get there early and have an opportunity uh, to park at a discounted rate. Ooh, and that's I like awesome, you right? that up. Yeah. I like <laughs> you bringing that up. Thank you very much. And we'll keep but it thank you, that. really, thank you very much. Yes. And it's no problem. <laughs> uh, it's awesome to hear how, you, how that went down, uh -huh. the challenges of having a family and making sure. plans. Sure, well, we were going them. to the game anyways. And you're so. like, oh, shoot, I got to work. Were they annoyed because... When I last spoke to your dad at the baseball game uh, over there in Utica at Jimmy John's Field, he kind of let in some insights regarding some of your processes, and sometimes he's maybe a little bit perturbed that you have to work and do some things as opposed to spending time with the family. So you had to go and say, hey, hey, I got to work today. <laughs> he was perturbed, I think, a little bit because of the process in which it went down because I wasn't notified until yeah. very last minute. And then we were planning to go to the game already, but then we were making plans for the day Sunday morning. I got a especially early, to do some other stuff at 7.30, which is bright and early, really bright and early for me, okay? Trust me, my parents know that. Everybody that knows me know that's extremely bright and early for me. So I was up early to get some other stuff done and to start working on some free press-related stuff since I, you know, worked for seven or eight different companies, right, as a freelancer. And then all this hits me, like something that I didn't see coming my way, and a quarterback being blindsided. That's how I was. Kind of, I felt that way, being blindsided. Now, it was a great day for me because yes. I ended up covering— professionally yes. still be in there to cover Alan Trammell's jersey retirement ceremony. And when you're driving home and you're with your family and just relaxing from the long day, and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, Dad, that's my question. I told them. That's no, my question. And they loved it. Yes. yes, they loved hearing that. And then my dad heard it. He listened to the free process video. They posted something Anthony Fennec did. You know, he was there covering the game. So the whole entire press conference of Alan Trammell's press conference was there. is there on their website now. So you can hear me via that outlet as well. You know, an entity that I do some freelance work for and now do a prep sports, prep football podcast, the Prep Football Frenzy podcast as well. A little shout out for that. But anyways, I saw Fennec too, and he told me I could use any video because I was asking. I wasn't sure. Hey, what kind of video, how much of it? He just ran the whole entire thing. So he told me just run it, man. So I did. Those short, you know, little... You Good. Know. You ask questions. Good. And you learn. So I asked him. I kind of found out. So I ended up using some video. And the video that I thought was worthwhile to utilize on yeah, Twitter. Question, obviously of course. my question. But one of Whitaker, I think, too, I utilized. Yep. So some other stuff, some photos, all fun as well. And I'm glad, man, that I was there to cover that game. Not just to watch the game as a fan. Because I was going to be there anyways as a spectator, perhaps. Well, I got the chance to actually be a credentialed media member. And what a hell of an experience. And you know what? I could say the best and biggest game of the Tiger season because they've been stinko. All season long. 53-78 and 78 coming into Tuesday night's game with the KC Royals, who are equally and more miserable, actually, at 40-91. and 91. Doc, by the way, the Tigers, 
have gone 7 and 16 in August, leading into Tuesday's matchup with the Royals at Kauffman Stadium. And I have some five numbers to reveal as part of Vito's notebook this week. And the Tigers contest Tuesday night is at 8 15. And some big news about Nick Castellanos, about Jose Iglesias. But here's a note about the Tigers against the Kansas City Royals really quick. The Tigers haven't had a winning record against KC since 2014 when the Tigers went 13-6 and versus the Royals. If you remember right, that was the last season in which the Tigers made the playoffs, 2014. And this season, the Tigers stand at 6-7 and against the Ned Yost-led KC Royals. And another thing here, since 2015... The Tigers have gone 30-40 and 40 against the Royals and have been outscored by their American League Central division rivals, 376-295 to 295 since 2015. So prior to the series um, with the White Sox, it was a four-game set. Um, I guess, you know, the attendance was strong, but you could still, in some shots on the television, you could see that the upper deck was pretty much empty. A lot of people kind of in the corners there weren't a lot of fans in those upper deck seats at times throughout the game, and especially when the Detroit Tigers took a loss. Do you think that it was okay to do it that weekend versus the White Sox, maybe not just waiting maybe for a Monday night versus maybe Houston or a different day? Do you feel like that day was a good day, a Sunday, decent weather, not the greatest, but do you feel like that was the best time for that ceremony? I think it was because of the fact that it was before September. It People go busy. back to school, go back to college. And it was still nice out, still summer, summer weather. And end of the season, it is. But, you know, they had to wait because they, the reason is they wanted to wait until those guys were in Trent and Cooperstown. They waited for those ceremonies to happen for Major League Baseball. And then once they were actually enshrined in Major League Baseball's Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, well, then they could actually retire the jerseys of Jack Morris, August 12th. Alan Trammell this past Sunday, August 26th, against the White Sox. Now, the best matchup on paper? No. Now, the Tigers got to face Michael Kopech, this youngster, Ace caliber arm, probably of the future for the White Sox. Has strikeout stuff, nasty stuff. Made his second start of his major league career on Sunday against the Tigers, and the Tigers couldn't hit him. The Tigers lost that game. Did not look good against the White Sox. Lost obviously. the last three or four in that series. Yes, and it was very surprising in that uh, the Tigers had success versus the White Sox, and also were playing pretty decent at Comerica Park, but. That weekend series versus the White Sox. I'm sure Dom was really thrilled to see the White Sox take three or four from the Tigers. But all in all, baseball wise, that was a tough weekend to watch. Jordan Zimmerman didn't perform all that great. You had a bunch of errors. You had situations in which the Detroit Tigers did not perform as well. And it's now officially basically riding out the string. And now we're going to see what's going to happen for the September call ups. And now the competitiveness for the squad is basically over. They held on as long as they could, but now basically the season's competitiveness over. Competitiveness? The Tigers? It ended, uh, when was the first game? March 31st? <laughs> it ended that, man. Remember, the Tigers this season. you just got to remember, at one point this season, they were one game under 500. Uh-huh, and they teased us. Two and a half to three games out uh-huh. of the division. They were close. They were right there. And all of a sudden, it just uh, it, it fell up. And obviously, with Mike Fires moving on, it's an obvious rebuild. They were sellers. It's just a situation in which... Uh, the season was going to fall off, and you're just picking up people here and there to see what they can do. I mean, Zach McAllister didn't even make it, I think, 30 days, and he was already DFA'd. Uh, you have situations in which a bunch of people are getting chances, and if they're not going to make the most of their opportunity, they're not going to be here. But all in all, now for the next 30 days, you know, the next six weeks of the podcast, we're just going to look at a couple different players and evaluate what they're doing. But unfortunately, basically, to summarize, the last week for the Tigers was pretty bad. The Tigers are who we thought they were, to use a line of Denny Green. Former yeah. Cardinals head coach, deceased now, great, Denny Green. Now, they've bottomed out. They really have bottomed out, right? But in the Central Division, there's still worse teams. That's how bad the American League Central Division is. These Kansas City Royals are 40-91. and 91. That's 51 games below 500 going wow. into the series, two games set at KC with the Tigers. That is miserable, beyond miserable. The Tigers are miserable. KC's record in season th- this far, uh, beyond miserable. Right, wow. You could say that easily. They have nothing to work with. The Tigers at least have something in the farm system. The Royals, I think, rebuild will be even more prolonged than the Tigers. And speaking of the 40-man roster, rosters expanding on September 1 to 40 men. Well, 
the talk is that Kristen Stewart will be called up. Now, Ooh. can he play in the field? I don't think he still has a good enough glove to play the corner outfield spots. But as a DH, to spell V-Mart, to give V-Mart some rest and days off, well, you put Kristen Stewart at DH. So he's one guy that I think will be called up definitely come September 1. Outside of that, who knows? But I guess it's a little bit, a tiny bit exciting that we will see some new faces on this Tigers roster come September. And then the Tigers will ride it out, see what they have in these younger ball players that will be called up in September. And then those guys, hey, maybe they make enough of a, a solid debut and showing in the majors the month of September that those guys become major league uh, roster presences. They become a presence right next season, come opening day even, and you know, meaning making the opening day roster. So they got to see what they have. They will in September, and that's one positive to take from the Tigers the rest of the way this season. And also, I know that you had said in previous podcasts that Lugo wasn't really solid all year. But in August, he has been, you know, really productive. Uh, He's been highlighted by the fact that his bats come around a little bit. Now, obviously, in totality, his numbers don't look excellent. But he's had a decent uh, August. And you just want to see those minor leaguers continue to evolve. And you want to see progression. And a lot of players have progressed. But one thing that was brought up a little bit in circles and in the media as well is that, like you said, you know, the White Sox were able to call up somebody with a magnificent arm, throws her in the high 90s, and, and is magnificent, right? And who are, the, who are the Tigers bringing up this year? The players that we have seen called up and getting their chances really aren't that sexy at all. I mean, Artie Lewicki, forced out again. Unfortunately, he's going to have to undergo a second surgery on his arm. Other players that have come up have really been underwhelming. And for me, I'm a little bit jealous knowing that, man, some of the players that have been called up, obviously Nico Goodrum, decent, but... Miserable second half. A buck 83 in the second half. Plays well at Comerica Park, but you look at some of the players that have been brought up and you're like, oh, it's not the best, especially in terms of the arms. I mean, Ryan Carpenter keeps coming up and gets spanked. So to summarize, it's just not as sexy. I'm jealous in that other organizations can bring up people, and maybe the September call-ups will change my mind and thinking. But, yeah, a lot of the call-ups, especially in terms of the arms, haven't been that sexy. And it's just one of those things where it's time to start evaluating the future. Now, at this point in time in the season, we can look at player development, what's happening in the minors, what's going on with some of the players that do get called up, the expanded rosters and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see. But let's take our first time out. We'll come back. We'll finish this podcast with Vito's Notebook. And definitely we'll break down anything else that has come across your interest in the world of Major League Baseball. Stay with us. You're listening to Tigers Talk on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. So, Doc, I had a heck of a time at the Zenith Prep Kickoff Classic this past weekend, Thursday through Saturday, August 23rd through 25th, at Tom Adams Field on the campus of Wayne State University. Just a great university, great campus to host events, to host charity softball games. In my third annual Churko & Company charity softball game, the Zenith Prep Kickoff Classic, the Detroit Sports Commission hit a home run hit a huge home run, like 500 feet out of the ballpark with how they handled and hosted the event, the hospitality, and everything that they took care of. They put on a great showing for themselves and for high school football as a whole throughout the state of Michigan with the event. And to find out about all the other great events as well that they are bringing to our very region, Doc, the Metro Detroit area, please follow the DSC, that is the Detroit Sports Commission, on Twitter and on Instagram at DET Sports. And make sure to check out their terrific website at DetroitSports.org. And, Doc, the Tigers have Artie Lewicki and Jacob Turner and the White Sox and Michael Kopech. I mean, God, right? Like you said, I didn't really get the chance to speak. I was going to say there's a big, big just uh, discrepancy or disparity, really disparity between the White Sox top prospects, right, and the Tigers top prospects. You have the likes of Michael Kopech, starting arm that can throw – uh, almost 100 miles per hour, like throw 96, 97 consistently, has great stuff, a future ace of the White Sox rotation. Eloy Jimenez, great outfielder as well in their farm system. And the Tigers have the likes of Kristen Stewart, Jacob Turner, Artie Lewicki floating around that aren't top-tier prospects or were never or just aren't now like Artie Lewicki, Jacob Turner was. He's washed up. I mean, Zach McAllister, they tried out. He's not a prospect, but they tried him out. Just a lot of guys the Tigers have that don't compare to what the White Sox have in their farm system, and they're leaps and bounds above the Tigers when it comes to rebuilding. 
But also, you have to remember, I wanted to bring this up as well. The White Sox' rebuilding efforts started a while back before the Tigers' rebuilding efforts did officially begin. So the White Sox have the jump start, but their farm system just completely, you know, leaps and bounds once again, dominates the Tigers' farm system. And now the thing is, once again, to reiterate my point from before the break, we want to see what the Tigers have of their farm system guys in the month of September, the guys that are ready to contribute at least a little bit. Bring them up in September, and then let's see what they're made of. Are they major league quality, or do they show a glimpse of being major league quality arms or positional players. If they do, we want to see them come 2019 then too and make the major league roster come opening day or at least midway through next season. Yeah, definitely. I think that the draft, what they do in free agency, restocking that minor league system, and obviously when these players come up, you got to have these people you know, perform. We don't want to see Christian Stewart come up and have like a, a three for 30 start yeah. in September. You just want to have a little bit more hope with some of the players that are called up. Well, yeah, you do. And you want to see the Tigers now start stocking their farm system with positional player talent. Now, they have Isaac Paredes, middle infielder, can play the infield, good bat thus far in the farm. Daz Cameron, the son of former longtime Major League outfielder Mike Cameron, Daz has shown some power, some quality outfield playing ability. We could see him at the Major League level, I think, come 2019, at least midway through next season. Isaac Paredes, I'm not sure when, but I know they want to get him to the majors. You just don't want to rush anybody to the bigs, too, before they're ready. Like you said, Kristen Stewart, who I don't expect to just light the majors on fire. I don't think he's going to be a great major league talent. A fourth outfielder that hits for some power is a DH. That's the thing with them, more of a DH bat. So we'll see what he's made of come September as well. But now, to get to Vito's notebook on this week's episode of Tigers Talk. And I already brought up a stat about the Tigers versus the Royals since 2014, not having a winning record against KC since 2014. Now, to some other news and notes, and first with Nicholas Castellanos. With two runs batted in Friday against the White Sox dock, Nicholas Castellanos has driven in 19 runs versus the White Sox this season. It's the most RBIs by a Tiger against Chicago in a single season since Charlie Maxwell drove in 19 runs himself in 1959, long before I was born. Long before I was a thought, long before you were a thought, I believe, as well, Doc. Moving on to Jose Iglesias. He has been ripping and tearing the baseball in the second half. In 31 games and 106 at-bats in the second half, the 28-year-old shortstop has hit 283 with three homers, 14 runs batted in, and a 786 on base plus slugging percentage. In contrast, in 92 games and 320 at-bats in the first half of the season, the Cuban native hit two home runs, drove in 34 runs, and recorded a 266 batting average with a 677 OPS. So below average OPS, very lackluster OPS with that being said as well. Mikey Machuk, how about bringing him up now? The outfielder who has spent time in AAA Toledo playing the outfield there, was good in the second half of last season for the Tigers with the bat, but this corner outfielder slash center fielder can play some center field too and I think is a fourth outfielder, is currently enduring a serious power surge. In his last 11 games and 34 at-bats, the 28-year-old has hit 265 with four homers, nine runs batted in, and an on-base plus slugging percentage of above 1,000, 1.037. In his previous 32 games and 109 at-bats, he recorded zero, exactly zero homers, five RBIs, a 193 batting average, and a measly 485 OPS. And last but not least, to talk about somebody having a lackluster performance in the second half. I already brought up the name, but a guy that you had mentioned in a positive note or positive fashion. Well, that guy is Nico Goodrum, who has not hit nearly as well in the second half as he did in the first half for the Tykes. He has struggled mightily in the second half with an average of 183, four home runs, nine runs batted in, and a measly 580 OPS and 31 post-All-Star break games and 115 post-All-Star break at-bats. So with all that being said, Goodrum had a much better first half. You look at his numbers in the first half. In 78 games, 248 at-bats in the first half. The 26-year-old, remember, he is only 26, only a year older than me. How about that? He had 250, nine home runs, 32 ribbies, and a 774 OPS. Much below those totals in the second half thus far of this season, Doc. And will he rebound to have a better finish to the 2018 campaign? What do you mm-hmm. think? One of those situations in which, you know, it's really hard to tell when players are playing out the string, but definitely there's some matchups that are coming up. You got the Cardinals, you got the Houston Astros, the Tigers are playing some teams. Now, in September, towards the end of the month, is when you finish out the year, I think, versus the Royals, White Sox, the teams in the Central as well. So I think he'll do okay. Okay. 
Fair enough. Look at that. Simple as that, you're saying. I think he'll do better than this. I mean, he's got to do better than 183. He's below the Mendoza line. God, he's better than that. Now, he might have overachieved, and I think he did overachieve in the first half because the Tigers didn't expect anything from him. And he was one of their best, most reliable bats in the first half. I think the second most reliable bat in the Tigers lineup in the first half as a whole, outside of Nick Castellanos, who, remember, struggled to start off the second half too. Then he rebounded with the American League Player of the Week that he had. You remember, he did win the American League Player of the Week with the five uh, hits in the one game, career-high five hits in that single game. So that was a great you know, week for him. But Castellanos really hasn't killed the baseball in the second half either, and the Tigers as a whole haven't killed the baseball. And then you look at Sunday once again, in that performance, the game that I was at against Michael Kopech, the Tigers really couldn't figure him out in his second big league outing. And he has great stuff, but still you want to see the Tigers score more than three, one, and two runs in their last three games against the Shy Sox of all ball clubs. I know Kopech is good, but the rest of that White Sox starting staff really isn't, uh, they aren't guys that you should be only scoring one or even three runs against. So they, in total, they combined in the last three games against the White Sox of this past series, the Tigers combined. For six runs? Six oh. runs as a whole in their last three games against the White Sox this past weekend. That's not cutting the mustard seed. Not nearly enough. Obviously. Ugh. And uh, it's one of those situations in which when you're watching, do you still assume that they're playing hard? It's just the talent level now has kind of, like you said, water found its level, and it's just the team is not playing as well as they could, and uh, the talent's just not there. But the thing is, you're playing the White Sox. There isn't an extreme amount of disparity in talent between the Tigers and the White Sox. The White Sox really have less talent. They have a worse record. Or it did at least before this past series over the weekend when the White Sox took three out of four against the Tigers. So still for me, if I'm Ron Gardner higher Doc, that's unacceptable to me. Inexcusable. Against the White Sox, the lowly, measly White Sox, you lose three out of four at your home ballpark where you were really doing well, and then you lose three out of four? I don't care that it's in late August. The season's almost over, and your season's over as a ball club because you have no chance of making the playoffs. Still, that's unacceptable for me. If I'm skipper Ron Gardner higher, I am livid at the fact that the Tigers... I don't know if they mailed it in, but they did horrible, losing three out of four this past weekend against the White Sox. All right, what's upcoming this week? So you have the Royals, and then you have the Yankees. You have the Yankees for four games on the road at Yankee Stadium. Good luck against the Yanks. Oh, boy, Vito, yeah, you're just going to be hoping to be as competitive as humanly possible. One final thing. Yes. Um, I know some people are looking at Jordan Zimmerman and what he's been able to do. There was a piece in the newspaper discussing, you know, the fact that he's being a little bit stubborn and that there are times when he's throwing his fastball a little bit up and people are hitting it. And it's just a situation in which while he has been a little bit better than in years past, he's still not performing at the level of his contract. And uh, it's a situation in which he still does get swings and misses, but he can't get consistent outs. He's still giving up the long ball. He's still a little bit stubborn, according to the paper, in terms of wanting to blow his fastball by people. And it's just... It's not working out. He's not what he used to be, clear cut, and he's not accepting it. He's stubborn. He's a veteran arm that thinks he can just recover and be as good as he used to be when he was a front-line starting arm for the Washington Nationals. He hasn't been that with the Tigers, even close to it. Now, he showed some signs of it with the Tigers this season, but that's been it for him in an old English D uniform. That's how despicable he's been, and he's being paid all this money lavishly to be a front-line starting arm for the Tigers, yet at 32 years young, I would say years old for Jay Zinn, oh, boy. He couple, is near the end of his of career. A couple more years of his contract, too. Not good for the Tigers. Dealing with this albatross of a contract. And until, I mean, God, until 2020, his last season in a Tigers uniform making 25 mil is in 2020. Not oh, good boy. for the Tigers in their payroll situation moving forward. All right, Vito. One last note. Um, Ron Gardenhire, as a manager, do you feel like, you know what, this is the guy that we want to continue to mold these young, talented individuals do we feel like, okay, you know what, in terms of what we needed, he's a guy that's a calming force, isn't making a lot of waves. It seems like the clubhouse is still on board. I feel like in terms of evaluating Ron Gardenhire, it's definitely incomplete, but I think he's doing a decent job. I mean, you could always say he could utilize numbers a little bit better, but the roster's it's not conducive to fully evaluating the current skipper. The roster's so depleted. What do you have to work with? You and I can manage this team. It wouldn't matter. Right. It wouldn't matter if you have Jim Leland or Tony La Russa or any great manager of years past. wouldn't matter. This team is stinko. It's not going anywhere. It wasn't going to go anywhere. And now they have sunk. The team has sunk completely. They are way underwater. So we're going to just have to, you know, start evaluating these talented individuals that are in the minors and start uh, scouting. I think you and I just have to start evaluating what's coming up. And uh, 
We got to see what is going to happen in September because there's still a lot of key matchups. Justin Verlander is going to return to Comerica Park for the first time. Might go to that game September 10th. You and I might be there for that game. Yes, and it'll be a fun opportunity, maybe even to uh, ask JV some questions and things like that. So we'll continue to provide coverage, get some great stories, and also uh, evaluate what's upcoming for the Detroit Tigers in the, the coming months. What did we learn? Well, at least my opinion is that the Tigers' biggest, best day of the season was the Alan Trammell Jersey retirement ceremony. I was able to share the moment. Get the question fired off to Tram. I mean, what a moment and a pleasure, complete pleasure for me to speak with Tram a little bit there with that one question, to be a part of the media scrum for Sunday's game. Alan Trammell's number three jersey finally, after a long, long time coming, being retired by the Tigers. You've listened to the latest edition of Tigers Talk. If you want to follow Vito on Twitter, follow him at Vito Jerome. Again, if you want to follow the network, at Detroit Podcast. We definitely read all the comments and questions. We definitely love and appreciate everybody that shared memories and that said, hey, good job, Vito. Enjoy the day. And it's been fun uh, to take this ride with everybody from where we were to where we are going. And it's only just beginning, baby. Now that we're here, we got to perform. We got to do the job. And you did a great job uh, working for the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. And that's all we can ask for. See everybody next week, every Wednesday, Detroit Sports Podcast Network, Tigers Talk dedicated to Detroit Tigers baseball and National News and Notes. Adios.